wondering if we turn the lights down on the screen it might be might be easier to easier to see. Sure. Okay, how's that? Is that, is that, is that better? Great. Um, and, and and thank you very much for allowing me to come and speak in the in the, in the proper summer. I'm I'm a little bit uh, uh, overwhelmed to, to be in this room and when I think of the history of the people who talked here. Uh, I think Brian told me over lunch some of the names and uh, um, I, you will be disappointed, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll do my best. Okay, so the talk is, uh, the title is The Infinite Lottery. Uh, let me not hide anything from you, so let me give you an overview of where I think all this is going and what I, I think you should, uh, you should learn from this. Uh, the focus of the talk is this idea uh, that I think is pretty widespread in philosophy of science and has been for a few decades now. It's the idea that inductive inference is just the same thing as probabilistic reasoning. Right? So you know, if you want to understand aspects of inductive inference in any way in particular, you look to prob probabilistic formulae, probabilistic uh, reasoning. And the whole point of my talk is to say, <laughs> no, it's not always true. Right? That's, if I, can, if I can establish that and convince you of that, I will take the, the talk to have been successful. So what's the picture then that I'm, I'm looking at? Well, the picture goes something like this. This is a, a map of the universe of places where people do induct inductive inference. Or <laughs> <laughs> um, the best one I can find. Uh, the, uh, the, the view of people who identify inductive inference with probabilistic reasoning uh, imagine that probabilistic inference covers everything here. Right? Um, uh, the claim that I'm going to advance is, no, this isn't the case. Uh, probabilistic reasoning just works in some particular domain. And in that particular domain, it works terrifically well. And I have no, I have no problems with it. In fact, it's great fun. I, I, I do it myself sometimes. <laughs> uh, but then when you move to some other part, you get something else, and you get something else, and you get something else, and you get something else. Right. So, What's, what's at stake with this? Well, what isn't at stake is that probabilistic inference is enormously useful if you are in this part of the, of the inferential universe. Right? That's the place where you use probabilities and, and they do wonderful, wonderful things. But because there are these other places, what probabilistic inference cannot give you is something synoptic about the totality of inductive inference. Right? You want to understand some universal fact about all possible inductive inferences. The hope was that these universally applicable facts could be recovered as theorems in the probability calculus. That would be nice if it were possible. I would love it if it were possible. Uh, but I, I don't think it is because you have all these other, other parts where something else is, is possible. Now, the something else might be the world ahead calculus. Or it might be something that's so irregular that you really can't put a calculus onto it, but only certain inferential moves can be, uh, can be figured out. So let's continue then. If you adopt the picture that I have, then you want to know, how do I know which of these regions I'm in when I'm faced with some problem of inductive inference? So the, the question is, what determines which logic goes where? And the basic claim is it's all background facts. Whatever the background facts are, those are the ones that will tell you, they will determine uh, the logic that is to be applied, or even if there is a, a logic that's systematic enough to, uh, to, be, to be useful. Okay, that's the big picture. That's the, the, the basic idea of the talk. Uh, I could give you general arguments for why I, I see things this way. I think it's more helpful just to look at one example. I want to take you on a journey into one of these something else universes and have a look at what they look like. That's the, uh, that's the plan. And that universe uh, is defined by the idea of an infinite lottery machine. An infinite lottery machine lives in the literature already, but let me uh, remind you of how it works. Uh, it's this machine that comes equipped with a countable infinity of number balls, uh, and then it chooses one. Right? It chooses one without favor. Uh, you'll see I have the more advanced model here. You can get these on Amazon. Uh, if you go there, you want to get the ones with the metal casing, the more robust. Yeah. It's, a, it's a joke, yes. You can't get the ones on Amazon because you're, you're, you're wondering. Now, the, uh, the key fact about this is that, you, is that the choice is made without favoring any particular ball amongst the count of infinity of balls that are, that, are, uh, uh, that are in the machine. That's the background fact that, as you will see, is going to determine the, uh, the logic that's, that's applicable. So in order to proceed, we need to understand better what choosing without favor means. 
What it cannot mean is that each outcome has the same probability because we don't know the probabilities are going to be applicable here at all. So there's a, a simple idea that captures what we want, and it is the idea of label independence. Uh, you're choosing without favor among a set of outcomes if the statements that you make about those outcomes remain true when you switch the labels around any way that you like. All right, that's the intuitive idea. Uh, here's an illustration. We have a, a simple four-way randomizer. You spin the pointer here, it spins around and picks one of those numbers. And here's a statement that is true about this randomizer. Uh, the number, the outcomes numbered one or two, arise roughly as often as three or four when you spin the thing many times. Now that statement is going to remain true no matter how you switch these labels around. Right? That's, the, that's the basic trick. So here I switch them around by reversing the order. So it goes one, two, three, four. That'll, that'll, uh, that statement will still remain true. And then here's another permutation of the labels. These are just permutations in, in the, the standard uh, meaning, meaning of the word. And you know, that captures what it is to choose without favor. Clearly works um, very nicely for the uh, finite case. The goal then is to apply it to the infinite case as well, All right. And um, when we uh, and and so the condition becomes: if we permute the labels on the balls, right, that's not going to have any effect on our statements pertaining to the chances of drawing a particular ball or a set of balls. All right. And so uh, I use the word chance here in a generalized sense. We don't yet quite know what this means. In fact, the burden of what comes next is to give a more precise meaning to, to, that, word, uh, to that word chance. OK, so let's start the exercise. Let's see how this works. We start applying this condition. Here I've laid out the, the balls. Um, I've colored them for convenience. There's no intrinsic difference between them as far as the, um, uh, the choosing mechanism is concerned. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we ask the question, what is the chance of drawing an even-numbered ball versus the chance of drawing an odd-numbered ball. Well, there are three possibilities. The chance that the odd-numbered ball is greater than the chance of the even number, the two chances are equal, or the chance of the odd-numbered ball is less than the, uh, the chance of the uh, even-numbered ball. Or another possibility I won't consider, they might be incomparable. Right? But I'll set that aside. That's another route that you can follow if you wanted to. So, one of these, or, or I suppose in principle all of these, uh, uh, might remain true when we permute the labels. Right? If the selection is done without favor, then the true statement here is the one that's going to survive permuting of the, of, the, of the labels. So let's permute them. Here we go. We'll switch the, the numbering on the red balls with the numbering on the blue balls. And you'll see immediately that this one here, that the chance of odd is greater than the chance of even can't survive because we've now switched what was odd from the top row to the bottom row. So we started out saying the top row has a greater chance than the bottom row. We switched the labels. We'd now be saying that the bottom row has a greater chance than the top row. If this has the normal ordering properties, then, uh, that, then that cannot be. Analogous, an analysis over here says that this inequality also is going to fail. And so the guy that survives is this one here. So the chance of an odd number is equal to the chance of an even number. And I'm hoping that's comfortable. I mean, that's just what you expect to happen. And that the mode of reasoning there is, is clear and, and unproblematic. Right? And if you're agreeing with that, you now fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> uh, because now, now it, gets, it, gets, it gets rocky. So we'll go back to the even and odd numbers. Uh, but we're going to uh, reorganize things in a slightly different way. So let's make a bit of space here. And then I'm going to pull the three down like so, move the five over, pull down the seven, move over the nine, and then fill in the rest. All right, I'll mention for future reference, when we read down the columns, we now have one, three, two, five, seven, four, nine, eleven, six, thirteen, fifteen, eight, and, and so on. So you have two odd numbers and an even, two odd numbers and an even. You'll see why I'm pointing that out when we get to a, a part of the talk later on. Now, I want to renumber or relabel the rows here. I want to call the first row odd subset 1 and the second row odd subset 2. Without going through the analysis that I gave in the last, in the last uh, uh, slide, you can see that by permuting 
the labels on the different rows, it's going to be easy to get to this result. But the chance of this even numbered row is equal to the chance of odd sub 1, which is equal to the chance of odd sub 2. You just switch the, the labels around every, every which way, and that's where you, you end up. But now you can see what the problem is going to be. We had from the earlier slide that the chance of even is the same as the chance of odd, but we also know that odd is the disjunction of odd subset 1 and odd subset 2. So we now have this, right? and if you compare those two lines, you'll see that we have a failure of additivity. Right? So this is the characteristic of this logic. It is very highly non-additive. Nothing, nothing adds up. Right? Now this is just the... Uh, shall I pause there? Or is it it's clear? Right? Okay, good. Um, uh, nothing adds up. And once you see the move, you can do it over and over again. Maybe it gets a little bit tedious. Here are the numbered balls all laid out again. I could pull off all the labels and then put them back on. Here's one way that I could do that. They're off. Now they're back on again. The red balls are being renumbered by the powers of 10, 10, 100, 1,000, and so on up. And then all the remaining numbers get put through, like, like so. And so you can see, uh, same argument, just run through the whole story again. The chance of a number being drawn from the power of 10 Right, which, which becomes exponentially diluted in the normal ordering over these, over these balls. It's the same as getting uh, the chance of an odd number, which is the same as the chance of an even number, which is the same as the chance of the complement of the set, you know, the set that contains no bounds of 10. Right, that's the characteristic of, of this logic. That, that, that's what happens here. Okay. You've seen enough of the moves that are used to create the logic. The step to getting to the, the full logic is now pretty simple. Right. The first thing you need to do is to figure out which sets are going to be equivalent under permutation of the, of the labels. And uh, there are uh, a, a number of different sets. Uh, the simplest ones are the finite sets. So, for example, any set that has only three uh, members in it is going to be equivalent to any other under, under relabeling. Right. Um, then there are, that's, let's write that finite sub n where n is the number, is the cardinality of the set, um, assuming finite cardinality. So, so that is n, uh, that is finite sub 3 over there. Then there's the largest set, uh, the set of, of outcomes that is infinite, and its complement is infinite. So these are the infinite co-infinite sets. Uh, examples, even numbers, odd numbers, prime numbers, powers of 10, and their complements. Then, <coughs> there's the infinite sets that are co-finite, so these are the complements of these sets here. So the set of all numbers other than 1, 2, 3, the complement of finite 3, would be in there, and, and so on and so on. Right, so all of these are going to be equivalent under, uh, under uh, uh, permutation of, of the labels, so they're, going to, so they're going to have to have the same chance value. So let's write down what those chance values are. Uh, anything that is finite sub n will get a value of v sub n, v for value. I'm not very creative, but I figured I could have used some letter there. Uh, the chance of an infinite co-infinite set is v sub infinity, and the chance of an in infinite co-finite n set is v, I just do minus n to indicate that you're only taking out n, n members of the, of the set to which the uh, value is, is assigned. Now, to start attaching intuitive understanding to this, we'll just give them uh, labels. We'll call the first one unlikely. For this one to come about, you would need to have an outcome in some finite set. That's unlikely to happen because the alternative is an infinite set. Wasn't sure what to call this one, but as likely as not is the literal description. <coughs> because because each, each of these sets has the same chance as its complement, so as likely as not describes it. But that don't use probabilistic intuitions because it doesn't mean the same thing as that, just a literal description. And then finally, you have likely, because this will come about with finitely many exceptions. And uh, you know, just to keep the notation going, uh, we'll write v sub 0 as the chance of the empty set. That's certainly not. And, uh, and the chance of all outcomes is v minus 1 is certain. Right? So you'll, you'll see the way to use this logic. So for a generic lottery machine, one that is working pretty much as you'd expect, uh, you get this, the chance of, say, drawing a 1 or a 2 
is going to be less than uh, the chance of the, uh, uh, that's V2 is going to be less than the chance of drawing the power of 10, which is a V sub infinity, which is the same as the chance of drawing an odd number, uh, which is uh, less than the, um, uh, the chance of drawing the complement of, 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 uh, of 1 and 2, which is v, v minus 2. Okay. So how do you use this logic? Well, let's start thinking about a few cases, things you can do with it. Uh, you know that when the machine runs, it's going to produce a number. It could be one, it could be two, it could be a hundred, a thousand, a million, a number as big as you like. So think of a very big number that you like. Right? What's the chance that the number drawn is equal to or less than that? Well, it's going to be V sub something or other finite, whatever whatever number you thought of, V sub n, if n is the number you thought of. And what is the chance that the number is greater than that? Well, it would be V sub minus n. So no matter what number you pick, and say, what about a billion, what about a trillion, All right? Um, it's very likely that the number that the machine actually produces will be greater than that. You can never name a number big enough so that you've got a chance of the outcome being in that being, being in the set equal to, that, that comprises that or less than it, which is sort of weird, but that's the, that's the essence of an infinite lottery. That's just, that's just the way they work. And they're not, you know, they, they don't work the way a, a, a finite lottery would work. Okay, so you've got that idea. Um, you can press on. Once you, once you see how the moves are made, you can derive all sorts of um, uh, other results. So uh, here's another, another case. Let's, let's say that we line up a thousand of these machines some large number, a thousand will do, and their operations are independent, right? and then we, we just run them. And they'll produce a thousand numbers. I guess what the numbers might be. One comes from the first one, and some big number. I don't know what that is. Comes from the, the second, and so on, all, all the way through. That, that's one possibility. You might get all the numbers less than or equal to this n. Okay? All the numbers are kind of less than or equal to this n. Or you might get that all the numbers are the same. I've put eight here as an example. It could be one, 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 two, 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 three, 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 a gazillion, a gazillion, a gazillion, a gazillion, and, 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 and so on up. Now, yeah, it's worth just as an exercise, just to, just to see how your intuitions are going. It's worth as an exercise to ask yourself which has the greater chance. Now, my initial instincts, maybe they run as yours, but my initial instincts were, well, this has got to have the greater chance, surely, right? It's you know, all these all these numbers, right? Uh, but no, it, it doesn't work that way. Uh, this turns out to be V sub something or other finite, n to the power of a thousand. And this guy turns out to be V sub infinity. So it's much more likely to get this than, than this. And if you're thinking, wait a minute, how, how can that be? Well, just remember, pick some n, whatever the n might be. There are finitely many ways you can realize this outcome, but there are infinitely many ways you can realize this outcome. And once you, once you see that, then yeah, and everything's fine. Oof. Okay. It is, is it not? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Uh, so so what, what comes next? Well, this is sort of weird. And many people have this instinct. Well, okay, I, I get this logic is kind of weird. Uh, but why don't we just go empirical on this? Just get one of these machines, go to Amazon, <laughs> get one of the machines, and start running it. Just run the damn thing over and over and over and over again. Aren't you going to find out that you'll get roughly as many even-numbered balls as, as odd-numbered balls? I mean, isn't that isn't that instinctively what you what you expect to happen? Right. Well, um, we don't have the machine here, but we have the logic, and we can ask the logic what it, it thinks of that. So let's do the exercise. All right. We're going to run the machine n times, where n can be very very large. And we're going to ask the question, what is the chance that you get no even-numbered outcomes in all, in all n draws, or 1, or 2, or n over 2, or n minus 1, or n, in all, in all of those? Right? You're going to ask that question. Um, your initial expectation, if it was like mine, is you say, well, it's got to be bunched up in the middle here. Right? I'm going to expect a massing of the chance around n over 2, to even, even versus odd, and things will be unlikely down here. But no, it doesn't go that way. You actually do the sums, and they're not terribly hard to do. The it gets a little bit of combinatorics are involved. You get the same result in each case. So what the logic is telling you 
is that you can expect no stabilization of frequencies, no matter how long you, you, uh, you run this thing. Uh, there, is, there is no massing of, uh, uh, of chances around uh, N over 2, as you, would, as you would expect. OK. You, perhaps you're still thinking this can't be right. There's this big literature out there that proves that if you do anything like this, you have to use probabilities. Because if you don't use probabilities, all these dreadful things happen to you. There are representation theorems and, and so on and so on and so on. I've, I've been working through these fairly systematically. And the conclusion about all of them is that they're all circular. Um, if you like that literature, you don't notice it because you believe the conclusion. And if you believe the conclusion, uh, you're willing to accept tendentious premises right, that will get you to that conclusion. And if you think about any proof that you have to distribute credences probabilistically, they're all deductions. And if they're deductions, the premises have to be at least as strong as the thing that you get out. So the premises have to have buried in them the assumption that you, uh, uh, that you want to get out. OK, that, that's a very general, very general claim. I just want to, I just want to give you uh, an, an example of, of how that works. Uh, someone who distributes credences as I, you know, that match the chances that I'm recommending is going to be subject to a Dutch book. Right? So let me just set up the Dutch book and then figure out what it means. So I'm going to talk about outcomes 1, 2, and 3. I'm just dividing the numbers naturally into three sets. 3 is uh, 3, 6, 9, 12, all the, all the multiples of 3. And 1 and 2 are the obvious, uh, obviously moves from that by one step and, and, uh, and two steps. Now, if you've seen the way the logic works, you'll realize that the chance of getting a 1 for someone who, uh, in the logic, uh, is the same as the chance of getting a 2 or a 3. Right? They are both infinite co-infinite sets. Same chance, you assign the same credence to it. Uh, but of course, the same can be said of 2, and the same can be said of 3. You're assigning the same credence to 2 and 3 or 1, or to 3 and 1 or 2. So now you go through the standard setup of, uh, of a Dutch book. If you think that, if you have equal credence in two outcomes, then you're willing to accept an even odds bet on either outcome, and then if you figure out what's going to, uh, what's going to happen, uh, if you accept all three bets, you accept a bet on one, on two, and on three, you'll, if, if one comes, you'll gain a dollar, but if two or three, you'll lose a dollar, or perhaps over here a pound. I should have updated that, I'm sorry. I'm not being respectful of local culture. <laughs> uh, and so on, all the way through here, then you add up the columns and you make a short loss of, of, of one dollar. Okay, so that, familiar stuff. That looks pretty bad. Um, this, what I'm just describing for you, is an instance of the many theorems out there. This is a very weak, <coughs> simplified version of a, of a Dutch book theorem. It just says this: if your credences match the non-probabilistic infinite lottery chances, and you accept even odds bets on exclusive exhaustive outcomes with equal credences, then a sure loss <coughs> Dutch book can be made against you. Right? That's, that, that's what you expect. Now, what's the normal diagnosis of this? The normal diagnosis is to say, aha, here's the, here's the problem. You have uh, uh, incoherent credences. You shouldn't have those credences. Uh, you're going to be sucked into a, uh, a situation where you make a sure loss, and that's a bad thing, and you don't <coughs> like sure losses, do you? Um, I think that's actually the wrong analysis of this. Uh, the correct analysis is this. If you hold these credences, then what's incoherent is not the credences, but it's this betting behavior. If you hold those sorts of credences, what on earth are you doing getting involved in this sort of betting behavior? <laughs> because the, the rules of this setup, the whole Dutch book scenario, is not benign. It's set up to force your, prob your credences to be, to be, prob to be probabilities. Um, this stuff happens all the time. I, I'll give you a very much simpler example. Um, it's standard in the literature and decision theory that you can't have intransitive preferences. Right? You can't prefer apple pie to cherry pie, and cherry pie to peach pie, and peach pie to apple pie. I think that's, that's intransitive. Right? You, you can't do that because then someone is going to introduce <coughs> you to make a whole series of exchanges with money. Right, where you end up back with the same piece of apple pie that you started with and less money. Right? So it looks pretty good until you realize, look, 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 wait, wait a minute, there's nothing incoherent about intransitive um, um, uh, preferences. What's incoherent is if you have intransitive preferences that you're willing to entertain any sort of exchanges with another 
uh, thing over which you have transitive pre uh, um, uh, preferences. That, that, that's just a really bad thing to do. Don't, don't do that. Right? That's the incoherence. Otherwise, I don't, I don't see what, where I'm doing anything incoherent if I just happen to prefer apple pie to, to, to cherry pie, cherry to peach, and peach to apple. Right? It's just the way I am. If you give me binary choices, that, that's what we'll go with. I don't see any incoherence there. Okay. So far, so good. Now, at this point, here's a worry. This is a lovely, lovely logic, but it doesn't apply to anything. You cannot actually go to Amazon and buy one of these machines. So who cares? Right. Well, that's, that's what I worried about as well. I thought, who cares? So I was rather surprised to discover there's a community of people out there who actually ought to care. Uh, and these are the people who work in eternal inflation cosmology. And they have a thing called the measure problem. I'll describe the measure problem for you, and it will start to look very familiar. Right. So this, this is, I, I don't know, a lot of cosmologists here or non-cosmologists here. <laughs> The rest of you just don't know. <laughs> That's very, very interesting. I, I guess we are all cosmologists in the sense that we all, we all think cosmically, do we not? <laughs> all right. Okay. So, uh, um, eternal inflation is like Big Bang cosmology on, on steroids. In the theory of eternal inflation, the universe is always expanding, right? And, uh, and I think always has been. I think that's all right, Jeremy. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so this is the universe a while ago. It's the blue rectangle. It's the best drawing we could do of the universe. And uh, the way that the dynamics of inflationary cosmology works is the whole thing's expanding, expanding, expanding. Right? It's uh, expanding exponentially fast. And while it expands, it's spinning off little pocket universes uh, that look, you know, that, that could be like our universe. Right? Um, the inflationary expansion phase is not like our universe. We aren't in that in that phase because the uh, all matter is dominated by an inflaton field and blah blah blah. It just isn't isn't the way we are. These are produced through a reheating phase. <coughs> the system goes thermal and we get lots of lots of uh, lovely possibilities. So so here it is expanding and as it expands and these universes are spun off, right? Um, uh, more and more of them are created. Um, I've drawn them as balls with numbers on them because I really don't know how to draw. Uh, they call them little pocket universes. I, I don't know how else to draw them, and that, of course, is pretty <coughs> handy for what else we're going to do. Now, some of these universes might be like ours. These are in red here. Right? They look like the universe that we're in. Uh, others of these universes might be very much unlike ours. If you work in inflationary cosmology, if you work in eternal inflationary cosmology in particular, uh, what you would like to be able to say is that a universe like ours is somehow very probable. You would like your theory to say, yes, it's very probable that the universe we're in is the way it is because of the, the, the inflationary mechanism that, that produces it. So you'd like to say that these like universes are very much more probable than the unlike universes. However, when the cosmologists started looking at this, uh, they realized that there was a problem. They asked the question, what is the probability that the pocket universe uh, is like our universe. This is Alan Guth, who started off inflationary cosmology in the, I guess, was it the late 70s, roughly? Um, 81. 81. Calling it, calling it inflation because that was happening in the economy at the time. Right? So it's a, a fancy word. Um, and he says, you know, as soon, as soon as one attempts to define probabilities, you discover ambiguities, sample space is infinite, um, an eternally inflating universe produces an infinite number of pocket universes. And this is the key line here. The fraction of universes with any particular property is therefore equal to an infinity divided by an infinity, right? a meaningless ratio. Right? So he now, he now wants to reinforce this idea that you cannot define a, a, a probability for the property of getting a universe up like ours. And so he produces what I call the counting argument. This is just a, this is just a screenshot from my, my computer of the, of the page where this thing appears. But I just wanted to show you the number sequence here, 1, 3, 2, 5, 7, 4, 9. It's the one that I had earlier on. That's why, that's why I, I, I imposed upon your memories to, to, uh, to remember that sequence. So he's got exactly that sequence here. I won't read through this, but I'll tell you the argument that he, uh, that he runs. Uh, the argument I call the counting argument goes something like this. He says, think of all the numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. If you order them like this, right, 
then you say, well, okay, half of them are odd and half of them are even. And that, that's, that's perfectly fine. So correspondingly, you could imagine you know, universes like that. Half of them will be like ours, half of them will be unlike, unlike ours. But then he says there's another way of numbering. You can bunch up two odd numbers followed by an even, two odd numbers followed by an even, and, and keep going. And then you get, in the normal way of counting, using the normal way of regularizing this, you get uh, two thirds of the, uh, of the numbers are, are odd. Therefore, he concludes, the probability of odd uh, cannot be defined. Now, at this point, I have a very particular reaction to this, but the cosmologists have a, a different reaction. It's a reaction of kind of groaning despair. Oh, whoa, oh, whoa, something uh, really bad has happened. So this is good for continuing. So he says, to extract predictions from the theory, we must therefore learn to distinguish the probable from the improbable. Right? There's something missing in the theory. He wants to add stuff to it, the theory. The theory just can't make, make predictions without a luck. And this is E.S. Steinhardt and Lerb, who are uh, 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 severely critical of inflationary cosmology. They, they jump on this and they say, it makes no sense whatever to talk about predictions. Uh, you just can't make uh, any sense of predictions at all. All right. They're very good cosmologists. They're doing wonderful work here. But they don't have much of a head for inductive inference. That, that's my diagnosis. I, I think about this very differently. Um, uh, I think prediction is possible, but you have to find the right logic. Right? They're trying to work with the wrong logic. They're realizing that the probabilistic logic just doesn't apply, and so they don't know what to do other than to say nothing's working. Right? Uh, but the situation is, is, is very clear. There is a, a logic here that's quite native to the, to the system. It's that logic that belongs to the uh, uh, to the infinite lottery. I, I just put a snapshot of the screen up here where I developed the, the construction that Guth used. I just used the same construction in order to, uh, to set up the logic. You can make predictions, but the predictions are, I'm sorry to say for the cosmologists, of no use to them. It just tells them, yes, you're right, you're toast. <laughs> now, um, so it's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, it's a very stern one. It says uh, the chances that we get a, a, a like universe is the same as the chance that we get an unlike universe in the sense of this infinite lottery logic, which means you really don't get anything at all. It's a kind of a negative prediction. Now, if you're thinking a negative prediction, who, who makes negative predictions? What do you mean negative predictions? Well, negative predictions are actually stock in, stock in trade of, uh, of probability theory. So if you go to a casino, Right? Um, uh, and, uh, and you watch the roulette wheel, and you see a large number of reds all come up in a row, right? you are strongly inclined to make a prediction that, well, the next one will be red, or the next one won't be red. But if the wheel is operating as it was designed to operate, the probability calculus tells you a negative prediction. It says, no, that information is of no use to you, whatever, um, things are just as they would have been had you walked through the door and not had any of the history. The history is useless for making a prediction. You can't make any prediction beyond the, uh, 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 beyond the one you would have made when you first walk, walked through the door. Okay, so, all right, another, another possibility. Um, maybe, maybe frequencies can be made to work still. So here's the inflating universe, and here are all the uh, pocket universes that have been spun off like ones and unlike ones. Maybe there's some way of getting frequencies to work here. Well, so how might you do that? Well, one way of doing that is to divide up this infinite universe into pieces, each with a countable infinity of pocket universes in them. We'll number them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, etc., up to, up to n, and we'll just ask the question, what is the frequency of like universes uh, in, in this partition of the, uh, of, of, of the whole space? And, of course, you, you know the answer because I did the calculation before. Um, the uh, oh oh yeah, I, I missed the crucial. You've got to pick one using in each in each piece using the um, uh, using the infinite lottery logic and say, well, if we were in this sector, that would be us. If we were in this sector, that would be us, and, and, and so on. Right. So we did the calculation before, and the chance that there are no like sectors, uh, no like universes, uh, um, uh, in the n sectors that we looked at is the same as one or two or three or four all the way, all the way through. It's just for the infinity. Uh, and uh, the logic provides then no expectation of any stabilization of frequencies. So 
going out and observing is not going to get you anywhere if this is the appropriate logic that, that applies, and it is because these are the background facts that are, that are assumed. Okay, so I want to wind down now. The next slide is going to say conclusion, but that doesn't mean you can all get up and leave. I've got a few more to go. Okay. <laughs> Tempted as you may be. Um, so, you know, how, how do I finish here? Well, I think the stumbling block with this is getting used to thinking about chancy systems in an unfamiliar way. We all learn about probabilities very early on, we. Um, those of us who have technical backgrounds, and I'm assuming that's every, everyone here, and you, you just get very used to thinking about chancy systems in probabilistic terms. If something is uncertain, you don't know what it might be, you say, what the, what, what's the probability of that happening? Right? We're very comfortable with it. When you see this other notion of chance, right, um, you don't know what to think about. So what I thought I'd do is just tell a story about how to think about it. This is, this is not a, a rigorous you know, uh, piece of axiomatic work. This is just how should I think about this so I get comfortable with the, uh, uh, with, with the concept. Now, as it turns out, I have a very hard case already at hand right, where in spite of the enormous difficulty of learning how to think about the thing, you've all managed to do it. Right? And that hard case is actually the case of the probability calculus. It's actually really hard to get your head around this guy. Right, so let me describe a bit about a little bit of what, what the problems are. So, so think about the probability of some, some outcome. The values go on a scale from 0 to 1. What, are, what, are those, what do those numbers mean? Well, um, if you're very close to 1, then FAP, I'm using an acronym uh, that I think, if I take it, it was um, Bell introduced that FAP for all practical purposes. Uh, if the probability is very close to 1, uh, then, then the event will occur, or correspondingly, if it's very close to 0, then for all practical purposes, it will not occur. Uh, this is sometimes called Corno's principle. Uh, my view is that if you don't have some principle like that, then these numbers have no, no meaning in the, in the physical world. They're just numbers, right? 0, 1, a half, a third, right? they're just numbers. You, you need something like that. So okay, th those are the easy cases. They they work. You know, if you you know if someone says, you know, there is a a probability one that something is going to happen or close to one, well then you're going to say, well, okay, I better I better get prepared, right? Or if they say, well, there's probability zero of that happening, we're very close to zero. You'll say, okay, I don't have to worry about that. Right? That's you know that, that's just intuitively how you think about it. But what about these guys in the middle here? Um, we have a probability of 0.5 and a probability of 0.6. Well, okay, 0 0.6 is bigger than 0 0.5. Um, it's 20% bigger, so it's 20% more probable. But what, but what does that mean, right? I mean, in, in, in terms of whether something is going gonna, is gonna to happen or not. Right? Well, we have a way of dealing with that. There's a, not a clever way. We have these two cases at either end. And the way we deal with these intermediate cases to make sense of what they mean is by turning them into one of these two intermediate cases. So, for example, in the case of probability 0.5, uh, we say, well, it's a theorem of the probability calculus that a point, probability 0.5 event occurs with a probability very near 1 uh, in about 50% of mental trials. So a probability of, 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 of 0.5 means that if you repeat the setup over and over again, very likely you're going to get roughly one in two of the outcomes that, uh, uh, that, that, that are mentioned in, in, in the event. Then you separate that from probability 0.6 by doing the same analysis and very many trials, you get roughly 60%. Right? Now that's a hard case because in the case of the, uh, the infinite lottery logic, um, things are very much easier. There are these two extreme cases. There's the finite with the uh, uh, finite um, uh, co-infinite case up here, and for all practical purposes that will occur. Uh, in other words, they're going to happen with only finite exceptions. Right? Uh, and then at the other end you have, for all practical purposes will not occur. This is the case of finitely many outcomes, because there are infinitely many ways that the outcome can fail, compared to the finitely many ways that they can. Then there's everything that's, uh, that's in between, as likely as not, and they're all the same. <laughs> It's just everything else is this, and they're just all the same. So in a way, it's very, very much simpler. OK, okay still, let's, let's keep going. Um, um, I found the following way of conceptualizing things to be, uh, to be very helpful. Um, so um, 
the strategy is to do a benchmarking. So let's imagine that you know people are going to have a baby, right? And uh, you tell them, oh, you, you know that the, the probability that your unborn child will be a girl is 0.5, right? We, we make conversation like this sometimes. Now, um, <laughs> let's imagine that your friends are completely innocent of the probability calculus. They just never, they, they just skip that part. They just never knew. So like a foreign language to them. So, so they say, oh, well, what, is, what does that mean? probability of 0.5. Does it mean that one half of the baby will be a girl and one half will be a boy? Well, no, it's, it's not that. Oh, oh, it means that if, I have, if we were to have 10 babies, then <coughs> none, of, none of them could be boys. No, no, it's not that. Oh, it means, oh, you mean if I have 10 babies, then five of them will be girls. Well, no, probably five won't be girls in, in this case. I hope you're getting a sense of you know, it's, it's a subtle notion. You're trying to wrap your head around it. Eventually, you're going to get frustrated and say, look, you've got a coin in your pocket. You've tossed coins, haven't you? Right? The probability of getting a girl is just the same as the probability of getting a head when you toss a coin. Right? So, so whatever you think about that case, that's what you should think about this case. Right? You, get, you, get the, you get the idea? It's a, it's a simple way out. And, and eventually, you know, this is, in fact, the way I think we we ourselves learn the concept of probability, how to get comfortable with it. We, we, you know, we need you know, games of chance are the, are the way in. So now let's imagine that we have a friend who's a cosmologist who is you know, innocent of this particular calculus and is trying to understand what it means to say that the chance of getting a universe like ours in internal cosmology, internally explaining cosmology, is the same as the chance of getting one unlike ours. Right? And I was, oh, so that means that one in two times I'll, I'll get one like that. You say, no, 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 it, 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 it doesn't work that way. In fact, it's the, the same, well, you know, and then the discussion will go for a while. And then eventually I recommend you say the following thing in frustration. You say, you know, it's just like the chance of drawing an even number in infinite lottery. That's, that's, the, way you should, that's the way you should think about it. Okay, good. So, um, I have enjoyed our time together, <laughs> and uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, you have as well, and uh, um, uh, if you have, uh, you can go away and read some more if you, if you like. This is my, my website, um, which has stuff on it, and uh, if you scroll down a little, uh, you'll find, I know you can't read this, but it helps to see it, uh, you'll find a paper called Eternal Inflation When Probably It's Failed, that's there, you can download it there. Um, there's also a book on inductive inference that I'm writing. There's a chapter on the infinite lottery machines. You can, you can read that. And then as, as it happens, I just got interested in the physical question of how you might build one of these infinite lottery machines. And it turns out to be uh, vastly more complicated than I thought. And uh, I, I, I published a bit on this, although um, it had a big error right in the middle of it. that got just at the last moment. Still, still on I'm gonna, and, and I'm realizing now it's tangled up with all sorts of interesting issues in mathematics that I'll get to at some point. So there's the internal inflation paper that's still in manuscript, and there's the, uh, the how to build an infinite machine, and there's the 